I see you do not understand. <laughs> Did you come with Boone? Yeah. Through the warrior path? Or maybe you came down the Spele Waithipe in the Misha, in the large boats. I do not see much in the way of response here. Perhaps you came to see a savage. Yes. <laughs> or a demon of the forest. Or you've heard stories of how I murdered people. No. <laughs> or maybe you've heard I sold my people out. Perhaps you've heard that I moved them away to satisfy the white men. But see, you do not understand the whole story. Because my story covers a long period of time, and for many people it would be several lifetimes. And only if you hear the whole story might you begin to understand it even a little bit. So I must take you back a long, long time ago, even before our old people were here in this whole Ohio country. And they were not even known as the Shamano then. And they lived in a place that was very warm. And it was beyond the large salt water which lies in the direction that warmer weather is. Although that is hard to believe today. And they raised crops. And they hunted game. And they lived very peaceably. And they were under the leadership of two brothers. But you see a larger tribe, a larger nation moved in nearby. And they began to conduct warfare on them. And they would capture their people and torture the young men that they caught. And they would carry away their children and their women. And so you see the people came to these two brothers and they said, we must move away from this place. For you see, we cannot live under these conditions. And so the one brother said, Well, then let us build large rafts. And we will float across that great salt water that lies in the direction of that star that does not move in the sky. And we will float across that great blue water. And perhaps we will find another land where we can live peaceably. But you see, half the people were afraid of that great salt water. And so they said, no, no, to the other brother. Let us not go across the great salt water. Let us instead walk towards the setting sun. And when we have gone around that salt water, then we will turn towards the star that does not move. And we will walk until we find a good place to live. And so you see the tribes split and they went their separate ways. And the ones who were on the water floated for many days. And pretty soon they saw white sand along the horizon. And they came ashore. But you see, that sandy ground was not good to farm. And so they decided they would have to move on further to the north. And so they began to walk again. Now as they walked, they came to another river, a very large river. And we call it a Skipake Sipe. The blue water. Today is probably not as blue. You call it the Cumberland. And when they got there, they could not get across. And they said, we're going to have to build more rafts again to get across this river. And so they began to build the rafts. But while they were building, there were warriors that came up on the other side of the river. And they began to shake their weapons at them and to cry out. And their warriors said, we're going to have to fight again. But as they were doing that, 
they realized they were speaking the same language. They understood what those other men were saying. And so you see the two brothers and their groups came back together again down near the Cumberland River. And they formed back up into a single nation. And they looked for a place to live. Now while some of my people were living in that area, there was a great chief who came to the leadership position of the tribe. And he was well respected by his people. He was a great leader in war. And he was a very fair leader. And they wanted to have a child because he said, I want a son who will follow me as a warrior and a chief. Perhaps he will become a great leader of his nation. And they had a son. But you see, the son was very sickly. And they thought that he might die. And so they went to the medicine man. They said, what shall we do to make this child better? Because we want someone to follow in his father's footsteps. And the medicine man said, take him out into that salt water that you crossed many years ago and dunk him beneath the waves and then pick him back up and bring him back up across that white sand beach and bring him back to the village and he will become well. Not only will he become well, but he will grow up to be very strong and very fit his eyesight will never fail him. And he will become a great warrior. And he will become a leader of his people. And so they did so. And he did grow up fit. And he was known to be able to walk or to run long distances. And he was a great hunter because his eyesight was always very sharp. And so you see, they named him Kata Hakasa, which in Shawnee means the black hoof. And that is who stands before you today. In fact, I did lead my people. And so you see, they walked to the north into those lands across the Makahoke Sipe which is what we called your Cumberland River. And the reason we called it the Makahoke Sipe was because a Makahoke, if you have a tree and there's a large growth on the side of the tree, that growth is the Makahoke. And the way that we marked the place to cross the river was we would say, go to the tree with the Makahoke. And after a while, they begin to call it the Makahoke Sipe, the river with the tree with the large growth. And I'm sure you have seen some of these sycamore trees. They grew so large that even a man on a horse could ride inside some of them when they were hollow. And warriors would camp inside them to get out of the weather. And this tree was so large that when we came to that crossing spot, if you were a great warrior, when you got there, instead of crossing the river right away, you would begin to whistle. And you would walk around the tree. And if in fact you could walk around that tree with only one breath in the whistle, then you were a truly great warrior. And so we crossed the Makahoke Sipe, and through that land you called Tennessee, and on into the land that we named Kentucky. <coughs> and I mentioned Boone earlier, and I asked if you came with Boone, because he went back after having visited that land and said, Here is a land that is empty, there is no one here. It is there for us to take. And the game is rich and the ground is good and we shall raise crops. But you see, it was not an empty land. How otherwise did it get its name, Kentucky? That is Shawnee. And so you see, the people who followed him did not fully understand 
there were already people there. There were already villages there. There were already families there and children. And we were farming and we were hunting the game and we were living a very good life. We were raising the three sisters. Do you know what the three sisters are? I see some who do and some who do not. <laughs> the three sisters are the three crops we raise. They are the corn, the beans, and the squash. And the reason that we call them, the, do you have brothers? Do you share chores at home? Do you have sisters? Well, you, sharing the chores with your brothers is good enough. <laughs> you see, with these crops, we plant the corn first. And when the corn is the height of my knees, then we plant the beans next to it. And the beans will coil around the corn stalk. And when the beans begin to grow, we plant the squash or the pumpkins. And they have very large leaves. And they cover the ground so that the grass and the weeds do not grow. So you see, they all three grow better together. And they help each other out just as you and your brothers should do. And you will all grow better because of it. And so we raised the three sisters, and our farmers were very happy with that place. Now I say our farmers, but you probably do not understand that our farmers were the women. The women decided where to grow the crops, they decided when the land was played out and when they would change where it was. They decided where to build the wigwam. The wigwam belonged to them, as did the hoe that they used to tend the crops. If we were fortunate enough to have an axe to split wood with, which we traded to the white men for, if I wanted to use it, I had to ask my woman's permission because the axe belonged to her. You see, our women had a very large say in the life of the village. If we decided to go to war, the young men, as they are always wont to do, would gather in the council house, and they would beat upon their chests, and they would talk about the great deeds that they would do in warfare. And they would begin to get together to run from the council house and to strike the war post with their tomahawks or with the butts of their takiwa or their pimahiataki, their musket or their rifle. But you see, before they went, we would call in the two elder women of the tribe. And they would have the last say. Their vote was final. Because if I go off to war and I do not come back, who suffers? The women and their children. And so you see, they had that final vote. Now in the year that Boone crossed the mountains, 1775, if we went to the colonies, could the women vote? Could the women own property? Could they make business? Could they make business decisions? So you see, I think we were more progressive than white society was at that time. But perhaps maybe your culture learned from ours. But we were much ahead of you at that time. Perhaps we are not as different as maybe you thought. But Boone brought the people over the mountains, and they came down the Spele Waithipe in the large flatboats, and they crossed from that place called Pennsylvania, and they walked into the Ohio country, and we began to fight. Now, if you came home and found somebody camped in front of your log cabin, and they were inside your house, would you not fight? 
So how can you say that my people were wrong to have fought against these people coming into their land? But you see, they wanted to own the land. Ownership. Property. It is always at the bottom of the disagreements the white men have. We have no concept of private property. My woman owns the goods in the house, but that is all. How can you own the land? You may as well own the air that you breathe or the water that you drink. I think someday some man will try to sell you water to drink. <laughs> and so you see, our cultures did not even look at it the same way. And what we began to see was that the white men would come into the country and we'd take a much bigger axe than my techhawk and they would begin to put blaze marks on trees. Now a blaze mark is where you strike a tree and you remove the bark and it shows white down through the forest for a long way. And the white man would blaze a tree and he would walk for many paces towards the star that does not move. Perhaps many days. And he would blaze another tree and then he would turn towards the rising sun. Blaze another tree. Turn towards the warmer weather. Blaze another tree. Turn towards the setting sun and end up back where he started. And then he would go to where the white men gathered, and they called it a land office. And he would register that as his property. And they would draw pictures of it on the talking leaves. And he would say, this, this is my property, because I have blazed the trees. I have registered it. And you Indians, stay out of it. So you see, we fought. And we fought in Kentucky. And the white men, it became apparent there were two groups. There were the French. And there were, there were the Inglés. And they would come to us and say, you must fight for us. Because you see, these other white men mean you no good. They want your land. And the other group would say, but we are here to just trade furs with you. Because if we trade furs with you, you can get those things that make your life so easy. I'm a Europeanized Indian. Because I'm not wearing hides and furs. I have a linen shirt on. It's much better in this weather you have today. In cold weather, I wear wool. I trade for the iron. Iron tomahawks. Iron knives. My firelock came with trade from the Inglés. It all made me a better hunter. It made me and my family more comfortable. And so we, we became more used to interaction between our peoples. And in times of peace, it was not a bad life. But each group came to us and said, you must fight for us. Because these other people mean you no good. And so we picked a side. And we fought on the side of the French in what you call the French and Indian War. I still do not understand that. The French and the Indians did not fight each other. <laughs> and so you see in the French and Indian War, the white men fought against each other. And we assisted mostly the French. And I took a small group of warriors, for I was still not a chief. And I went from Kentucky into Pennsylvania to a place that you call the Monongahela. Perhaps you know it better today that what occurred there was Braddock's defeat. 
And my warriors and I, we fought alongside for a change. The Iroquois nation, because usually we fought against them. But you see, we were both on the side of the French. And we shot them down like quail. Because they marched in the bright red coats with the nice white belts crisscrossed across their chests. Ha ah. ha. Made a very good aiming point. And as we fought, they began to retreat. And the redcoats were beginning to run. But you see, there was a group of men among them who called themselves the Virginia Militia. And they were being led by a very big man. And he rode a great white horse. And he was rallying these Virginia troops. And I could see that he might turn the tide of the battle. And so I said, that man must die. And so you see, I loaded my Pima Hiyataki, my rifle. You see, the rifle is much more accurate at long distance than the Takiwa, the musket. And it's very good for that kind of warfare. And I loaded it, and I watched that man on the white horse, and I primed my firelock. And when he came riding back past, I aimed at him. Bang! <laughs> and I fired. Now, my eye is very good, and I am a great hunter. But that man did not fall. And so I reloaded my Pima Hiyataki, and I fired at him again. And he still did not fall, and I shot a third time. And when he did not fall then, I said to my warriors, the Creator has a reason for this man to live, else I would not have missed him. So there must be something great in his life that he is going to do. So you see, at that time, the who would become the leader of the Shawano nation had his first meeting with who would become the leader of the United States, your first president. And I would find out later that my first shot passed through his hat. And my second shot passed through the coattails of his coat. And my third shot clipped the reins of his horse. He was meant to be. And I found out later many other Indians fired at him on that same field. And in fact, his coat was shot full of holes. But he was not touched. And I always believe that the Creator has a reason for each man to live. And if you listen, you will understand that reason. And so we fought against the Inglés, and they won the war. And the Inglés and the French met to decide who would stay and who would go and what to do with the Indians. And did they invite the Shawnee to come to the treaty talks? Did they invite the Iroquois? No. And so we were left on our own. And the people continued to pour over the mountains. And so we fought. And we were pushed from Kentucky across the Spele Waithipe and into this country called the Ohio. And we were promised, after the battle of Point Pleasant, we were led by Cornstalk. And I had become a chief by then. 
And I fought there also. I would fight against the whites and the Americans in every battle on this continent until 1794. So it was decided at the treaty talks. They did talk to us then. Because you see, the battle at Point Pleasant was not an overwhelming victory for the white troops. It was more of a draw. And so they talked to us. And we signed a treaty that said, not just us Shawnee, but the other tribes also, would move north of the Spele Waithipe, and we would remain there. And the whites would remain south and east of the Spele Waithipe, and they would not cross, and they would not bother us. But you see, we began to see those blaze marks appear on trees again. And the men who floated down the river on the large flatboats, the Misha Alagasha, they would shoot at us if they saw us standing on the bank. It was great sport to them. And so you see, we raided the villages south of the river because we knew that they were going to come across the river. And soon the white men began to fight amongst themselves again. And this time it was a group who called themselves the colonists. And the Anglais, they called themselves the British now. They still wore those nice red uniforms. <laughs> and they both said to us, you must side with us because these other people mean you no good. And so you see, by this time, my men and I had become warriors all year round. You would call us today mercenary soldiers. You might call us light infantry. Probably at that time, the best light infantry in the world. Because we could live off the land wherever we went. And we traveled light and we could disappear into the forest. And the Inglés, the British, convinced us to fight for them. Because, you see, we saw the white men trying to come across the river. And so we began to raid the villages in Kentucky and Virginia. And we raided Martin Station. And we raided Ruddle Station. And we defeated them there. And we carried them away to Detroit and sold them to the British. But you see, it did not discourage them. Because a man named George Rogers Clark, who had captured Vincennes from the British, he came up through Kentucky and he stopped in the village of Frankfurt and he had his 175 regulars with him Men called the Illinois Regiment. They were in uniforms, blue uniforms, with white facings. Very military looking. But he needed more men. So he recruited militia from Kentucky. But they were so engrossed in owning property and taking custody of land, he could not get them to volunteer. So in Frankfurt... He stationed a guard and he closed the land office. And then he got his thousand men. And he marched towards Ohio. Now Clark will tell you that it was a great surprise to the Shawnee when he showed up at our villages. I will tell you now, I had spies watching him from the time he was in Kentucky and he crossed the river. And they would report to me every day. And my village was at a place called Pickaway. Not that place you know today as Piqua. But a location up on the Athene Sipe. Athene Sipe means the river with round rocks. You call it today the Mad River. And so you see they came north. And their intention was to burn our village of Chalagatha first. 
You are probably very familiar with old Chalagatha. It was once a pickaway site, too. You today call it Old Town. And when he got there, there was no one there. Well, of course there was no one there. I had warned the people ahead of time. And they had escaped to the north. And so he burned their corn. He burned their wigwams. And then when it began to rain, his men had to sleep out in the rain because they had no place to go. And in the morning, when they got up, they could not make their takiwas work because they were wet. And so he said, what you must do is pull the loads and then reload them with dry powder and shoot them to dry them out. But you see, they're military men. And so they all lined up in neat rows and they fired their muskets all at once. And their horses panicked and pulled their picket lines and they ran off through the forest and through the briars and the stickers. Do you think we were really surprised? <laughs> and so they spent the rest of the day chasing their horses. Excuse me. They finally caught their horses. And they advanced to the north, and they came to the Athene Sipe. And Clark split his men into three groups. His intention was to attack with the center group and the cannon from the middle and to surround us from the sides so that we could not get away. He did not want to have treaty talks with us. He wanted to kill us. Now, you see, I had already sent the women and children and the old men out. And all who remained with me were 300 warriors. 300 warriors not from just the Shawano, but from the Miami, the Ottawa, the Wyandotte, the Delaware, the Mingo, because we were all being pushed to the north. And so I hid my men in the cornfields. 800 acres of corn from your present day city of Springfield to the present day village of Enon. All along the low ground. And we fired on them from the corn and they were surprised that we were there. And Clark sent Colonel Logan to the east with one third of his army. And the great scout Kenton, who said he had been there before, he had run the gauntlet in this area. And he was supposed to find a way across the river and over the cliffs. And when we tried to retreat, he would cut us off and kill us all. But you see, the great scout Kenton <laughs> became lost. And so they did not find their way across the river and they did not find their way to the top of the cliffs. But when Clark rolled his six pound British cannon up in front of our fort and began to fire, we knew where the opening in the cliff was, and we escaped to the north and were gone. And we lived to fight again. But Clark will tell you it was a great victory. But then he moved back into Kentucky and back to Vincennes, and we fought the rest of the war, and the Americans won. And the Americans and the, colon or, and the English met and they had treaty talks. And do you think they invited the Shawnee to the treaty talks? Black Hoof? Did they invite Little Turtle of the Miami? Tarhe, the Crane of the Wyandotte? No. And so you see, we were left once again to have to fight for our land. And this would last until your general, until your president, Washington, sent a general we called the man who does not sleep. And you call him Mad Anthony Wayne. And we met him at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And at Fallen Timbers, we were beaten. 
And we retreated to the north to a British fort called Fort Miami's, near what you call Perrysburg today. And we knew the British would take us in, and they would take care of us and defend us against these Americans, against this man who never sleeps. But you see, they locked the gates, and they would not let us in. And I did not forget that. And we retreated on to the north. And when Wayne called for us to meet at Greenville and have treaty talks, I went. And I signed that treaty. Why should I not sign it? I was born in 1720. This is 1794, 1795 when I signed the treaty. Everything I have seen indicates the white man always gets what he wants. If for no other reason, then he just keeps pouring more numbers over the mountains. But I had that treaty read to me. And it said something very significant to me. It said not only will my people not fight against these Americans, my people are now American citizens. I'm an American citizen. And as such, this United States will defend us. And if need be, we will fight for the United States. And I am Black Hoof. I am Kata Hakasa. And I am speaking in front of the Creator. And He will hold me to my words. When we burn tobacco, the smoke drifts up and it carries our words to the Creator. And it says, what I am about to say, what I am about to agree to, I must be held to because I am an honorable man. And I have buried the hatchet with these Americans. So you see, when the warrior Tecumseh in the War of 1812 sided with the British. I did not see it that way. We belong to the United States and it to us. And my people will fight for them. And what your history books ignore is the fact that I took 500 warriors from the Shawnee tribe with me and their families and I went to General Harrison and I said, I do not want to fight against other Shawnee. But if the British and their Indians come south from the lakes, I know that your men are away to war. And your villages and your homes are undefended. And as I said when I signed that treaty, we will fight for the United States. And I and my warriors will meet the British and their allies before they get to these villages. And we will fight for you. Now we never had to do that, but I did provide scouts, we called them spies, to the American troops. And we always tracked where the British and their Indian allies were at. And we provided men to keep the American troops from getting lost in a land that they did not understand. And I went to Washington before that in 1802, after I had signed the treaty. And I said to your President Jefferson, I can, I can train my people to live the same as your people. I can make them good neighbors. We will agree to this concept of property, and you might call it reservations, but we will form reservations in Ohio. You need to provide us with three things. You need to provide us with a grist mill, you need to provide us with a sawmill, and you need to provide a blacksmith for each village. And we will learn to farm again we once knew how. And our women will learn to weave. 
and this is the hard fact, I will train my men to farm. Tell a man who has been a warrior all his life and followed the warrior way that he is now going to do woman's work. <laughs> but you see, we did. And we were successful. And we raised these new crops, wheat and oats. And we raised cattle and we raised hogs. And we were good neighbors. We were good citizens. And at Lewisburg and Wapakoneta, and Hog Creek, which is just south of Wapakoneta, we were successful farmers. And our women kept house and wove cloth. And it was a good life. And it went on until 1828. And I visited Jefferson again in 05, 06, and 1809. And after the visit in 1809, I went to your Congress. And I spoke to them. And in my speech to Congress, I spoke English. And I observed that the white people were being inoculated against smallpox. And I said, I need one more thing from your government. Send this medicine that prevents smallpox and send a doctor with me when I return. And I will inoculate my people against smallpox. And we did. And in 1828, the Jackson administration took over. And your President Jackson said, my President Jackson, said, we cannot trust the white people to be fair to these Indians when they live next to them. So let's send all the Indians west to the Mississippi, the father of waters. I did not sign that treaty. But you see, my people wanted to go. And so I made sure that they got to this place called Kansas. And I escorted them there. In 1828, I was 108 years old. I was always able to walk great distances. And the preacher J.B. Finley said about me, and his eyesight never failed, even into old age. And in 1831, I returned to Wapakoneta, Ohio. Because, you see, there was nothing in Kansas for me. I'm an old man. And when I got back to my two-story cabin that I lived in, in this little town called St. John's, when I got there, there was no one there. My family was gone. My wife had died years before. There were no children in the yard. There were no young men to listen to the great chief Black Hoof. And you see, the Creator said to me, Kata Hakasa, you've been a great warrior. And you've been a fair man. And you have dealt well with both your enemies and your friends. And your, your time here is done. And I passed from this world at the age of 111. <sighs> I'll be glad to answer questions. <laughs> Today we recognize Tecumseh in the history books. We call him a chief. He was not a chief. He didn't even come from a chief's division or sept of the Shawnee tribe. Uh, we call him patriot. He fought for the British. He tried to murder me. They declared me a witch, which made me el eligible for assassination. Who is the patriot? I fought for the Americans. 
I made sure that my people arrived safely in Kansas. I saved the culture of the Shawnee. Tecumseh died. And so did I later, too. What I did not know was that in 1860, the Kansas Land Act would transplant my people again from Kansas to Oklahoma. And I think that would certainly have broken my heart. And so the more I found out about him, the more I admired him. He lived from 1720 to 1831. And he saw this land when there was no whites here. Through the period of where he saw traders to when the whites began to push them out and to when he was forcibly removed to Kansas. He dealt with presidents. He spoke to Congress. Why is he not in history books? He had so much prestige during his lifetime. I'm going to revert back again here. There was a man named Bell, and he always said, you spell it like Beale, but it rings like a bell. And he was captured at the Battle of the River Raisin. And the British allowed their Indians to prepare him for burning at the stake. And I was always on the outskirts of these battles. I was 92 years old. I walked into that village and I took Bell by the arm and I led him south. And the Lake Indians would not touch me because I was Kata Hakasa, the Black Hoof. And I said to Bell, This war is over for you. I think it is time you go home. And he said, I live in Blue Licks. Kentucky. I said, I once lived in Iskapakathiki, Kentucky. That means the blue water, the blue licks. And so you see, we both came from the same place at one time in our lives. And I said, I could tell you much about blue licks. And he said, when this war is over, come visit me. And in 1816, barefooted, 96 years old, I walked from Wapakoneta, Ohio, to Blue Licks, Kentucky. And I said, I'm looking for, Le for Leonard Bell. And I met with him. He was still alive. And he introduced me to his friends. And we toured the area. And we told stories. And at the end of two days, barefooted, I walked back to Wapakoneta, Ohio. I was fascinated by this man. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, I've kind of taken it on as a personal thing to, to talk about him, to tell about him. Because in the Shawnee Nation, we don't have history books. We have oral history, oral stories. And that's the way knowledge is passed on. And what better way to pass on his story? And now you see... You are all part of that Shawnee culture now. And it's up to you to pass those stories on to the younger people. And we should always learn that from the mistakes in the past and from the things that have gone on. I do not place fault at the foot of the white culture. I don't blame Boone. Because you see, the real heroes in that story were those who fought for their land, but also those who followed Boone. They had no idea where they were going. They didn't know anything about the land they were going into except what people told them. And those were long hunters. You couldn't very well trust them sometimes. <laughs> they may as well have been going to the moon. And they followed him without question to what could have been their deaths. So you see, there were good points to all these cultures. The clash of these cultures. The British against the French. The Indian against the whites. The blacks who came over the mountains with the whites sometimes escaped to the Indians. 
the Shawnee would, would adopt them into the tribe. Once you were adopted, it didn't matter whether your hair was blonde or your eyes blue, your skin black or white. You were Indian. You were Shawnee. And you should be honored to be so. So you see, that's what makes us Americans. That's what makes us Ohioans. That's what makes us Kentucky. Because we are the mix of all those cultures. Shawnee men, you could compare them to the male birds in the forest. Uh, you know, cardinals, the, the bright, showy one is the male. Uh, and the Indians felt the same way about it. The men were very likely to wear lots of silver. Uh, they would paint themselves up in the mornings, whether we were at war or not. Uh, I'm wearing a peacetime paint scheme today, so to speak. Uh, some will say that the two red stripes from my eyes note that I am a Shawnee. Um, the rest of it is probably for decoration. Uh, the dot tattooing was quite often done by both male and female. Uh, and you also see versions of it very early on when the British first came ashore uh, in the colonies, or in, not in the colonies then, but uh, in, in the American continent. Uh, the, the woodcuts you see of the Indians that, that met them, they had dot tattooing very extensively uh, on their faces and on their bodies. It was done by pricking the skin with a sharp instrument, a lot of times a fishbone, rubbing charcoal into the wound, and then when it healed over, it would heal over with a black dot. Uh, during warfare, uh, it was psychological. The whites referred to us as demons of the forest. And so why not appear to be a demon of the forest? So lots of scarlet and black uh, for that, that kind of paint. Uh, so it, it can be both cosmetic and uh, uh, it can have meaning to it. A lot of times you'll see a teardrop from the eye of a, of a warrior and it may signify either people he has lost or things that he has done that he's not particularly proud of. Uh, so the answer is both. <laughs> Uh, that question comes up a lot. There is no secret Shawnee silver mine. <laughs> uh, but the, the Shawnee had a real uh, desire to have sh silver. They liked to work with it. Uh, they traded extensively with the Europeans for the silver. Uh, and it, if you do archaeological digs today on Shawnee sites, you'll find a lot of remnants of, of silver trade items. Earrings, uh, I have on the silver button off the front of an officer's coat. He didn't need it anymore. <laughs> uh, they were fascinated by crosses, not necessarily because of the religious aspect, uh, but it, it, to some it represented a dragonfly, and dragonflies sometimes were, were a, a signal of they would come and take your spirit to heaven. Uh, so uh, you would see those used a lot too as, as decoration. Rings on the fingers. Uh, the women, if, if I were a well-to-do warrior or chief, I would a lot of times adorn my woman uh, with uh, trade silver also. The women did not wear an extensive amount of paint, uh, usually two dots on the cheeks and maybe the part in their hair. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't paint up like, uh, like the men did. We were the peacocks, yes. <laughs> Feather thing that you were carrying, what was it used? That's a turkey wing and uh, it and a dress tomahawk, a presentation tomahawk, serve somewhat the same purpose. Did you not pay attention when I pointed at you? I did. <laughs> it was a symbol of rank. If you walked into a room and there was a warrior or a chief standing there with either a turkey wing uh, on his arm or a very fancy pipe tomahawk on his arm, he would use it to gesture when he talked, things like that. But it right away signified there is a man of distinction. We better pay attention to what he's doing and saying. Uh, in fact, Tecumseh at one time was very offended because no one was supposed to bring weapons into a talk and he walked in carrying a, a presentation grade tomahawk and they took it away from him. That was a huge insult because he was not carrying it as a weapon. It, was, it signified here's a man of distinction. He, he's worth listening to. Uh, now they did use tobacco, and they would use the, the smoke from tobacco to signify, and, and before I started my talk, I should have sprinkled tobacco out of my, my pouch. Both sprinkling the ground tobacco, if you, if you cannot smoke it somewhere, 
And smoking the tobacco, as I said earlier in the talk, signifies this, t this smoke is a messenger and it will take my words to the Creator. If it takes my words to the Creator, I'm held to those words. And, and so it's very important uh, and signifies it's very important. Mm -hmm. You said Tecumseh was not a chief. No. But we've all I know. been led to believe. That's that all, the history, all the history books say that. <laughs> to begin with, he was not of the uh, proper sept, either, either uh, Makoche or Chalagatha, which is where the chiefs came from. Uh, you call it Chillicothe today. Makoche is the same as you've been to the castles, the Makoche castles. They're not because of some Scotsman. They're named after that because the Makoche village was up there in that area when, when they uh, moved into that area and built or got ready to build those homes and stuff. Uh, you had Makoche, Chalagatha, Thawagila, Kispoko, and Pekaway. Uh, those were the, the existent SEPs, S-E-P-T-S, of the, uh, the tribe in the 1800s. They still exist today, in the 1700s. They still exist today. They still each have a little bit different um, functions within the tribe. They also have different political outlooks and they tend to split up into uh, their own uh, little groups. So what we have today is three federally recognized Shawnee tribes in Oklahoma. Uh, the absentee Shawnee, the Eastern Shawnee, and the Shawnee of Oklahoma. And those SEPs tend to divide up in separate tribes. Uh, so it, it even carries through to today, although it is becoming more mixed now. Uh, the uh, uh, Black Hoof was, was from the, uh, the Makoche division, and so he was hereditarily uh, eligible for being a chief. He didn't make it automatic, uh, so you had to establish yourself. He was what's called a civil chief. During most of his lifetime, the war chief was Blue Jacket, uh, and, and so they worked together. Now, Blue Jacket would later on adopt a little bit of the view of Tecumseh, although he died before the War of 1812. He died in 1809. So we don't know what he would have done uh, during, during the War of 1812. Uh, but Tecumseh was not from those divisions. Uh, even though he lived in Chalagatha during part of his life, uh, there's also some indications he lived in a Pickaway village part of his life too. So perhaps he may, may have been Pickaway division, in which case he would have been raised in the, the thought that uh, they were the experts in uh, spiritual things. And that's probably why his brother considered himself to be a holy man. I mean, yeah. wasn't the average lifetime then somewhere around 55 years? 40 to 45. Among the whites, it, it was... So men, he's a phenomenon. Men lived to be about 40, average, and women lived to be just a little over 30. So he was quite a phenomenon. Yeah, he, he was unusual. Uh, he was married for 40 years. Uh, which, and he was married to one woman. He did not have a polygamous marriage, which was unusual among Indian chiefs. Uh, he did not believe in polygamy. Uh, so uh, he, there were a number of things about him that were unusual, and uh, we have to say that, you know, he... Uh, in your reading, it sounds like he had full faculties. At yes, he nine years old. yes, he did. Yes, he did. That gives me great hope. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to hear. And, and quite often he would be asked to uh, speak for all the gathered tribes at various treaty talks and gatherings and stuff, or he would do a wrap up afterwards and kind of consolidate everybody together. He was also known to be capable of biting sarcasm. And, and he, could, he could eat you up if he, if he targeted you with that. More than likely though, at some time later, he would backtrack a little bit and smooth it over. Uh, he was a very influential man, very convincing. Uh, when he when he spoke. Oh, yeah.